Content warning. The following show will contain a excessive amounts of tobacco smoking, some potty mouth language, discussions of fictitious violence, and discussions of other things that make that may make people feel attacked. I promise you, we aren't attacking anybody. But with all that said, viewer discretion is advised. You think they'll talk amongst themselves while we run in and grab the thing that we thought we had? Well, you know, they're gonna have to. Yeah, it's true. All right. Well, hey, let's uh, let, let, let's do this real quick. Yeah, let's uh, let's turn the music back up. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, yeah, that's what we'll do.
You really need to get better about this. Shut up, dude. I just got home from work. All right, good point. Start the other music. All right, cool. all over the place I'm breaking the mic like what is up with me today oh man what is going on everybody I am solar grains the cinematic sorcerer coming at you from the dark side of the room with a busted up mic oh my god this is this is bad comedy this this really is this is but then what parts of my show aren't that's what I have to say like seriously most of this stuff is bad comedy and Welcome to the dark side of the room. This is the show where we talk about a great many. Th oh my god, what is going on with my walls? All right, uh, I'm gonna have to fix this. I'll be right back. That answer is a really big question. So, welcome to the Dark Side of the Room, the show where we talk about a great many things. We're talking stuff like gaming, life, interacting with people, filing your taxes. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. That implies that I make enough money to do so. I file my taxes and they're like... <laughs> Get this nonsense out of here. Now, seriously speaking, guys, uh, we are talking about a whole bunch of stuff on the dark side of the room today. And I love leaving the announcement with the questions like, hey, I'm live streaming and I have a question for you. Um, tell me about your personality. Now, tell me. Tell me, Clarice. Tell me. They were slaughtering the spring lambs, you know. And um, I love seeing all the people that come in when I do that, you know. I'm hoping for the reaction of like, hmm, what style do I role play? I don't know what style I role play. Maybe this bizarre black person can tell me. You know, eh, never know. Yeah, You never, never know. But we are talking about a lot of things today. Now, if, and I mean this, if you guys have any questions about um, the stuff we're talking about today and things like that, then I would like you to do something for me. I would like you to pull up your keyboard and type in back in the deck at gmail.com. That's B A C K I N T H E D E C K at gmail.com. You can also use that email address to send me some sort of communication through social media like Twitter. That's my ex. Um, Instagram, and if you go on TikTok, look up BidP, B-I-D-P-Y. And of course, you can always join Deckers on the Book if you're on Facebook and all that stuff. And I'm sure one of my two rider dies that have already left comments will be nice enough to put up an invitation to our Discord. Now, you guys might see that the very first thing I put up there today was donations. Hey! Um, along with the Patreon and the merchandise um, thing. So click on those because, you know, I need the, I, 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 I need it, man. I need it. I need it, man. I, I don't, I don't want to have to go to my day jobs no more. They cause my body so much pain. <laughs> so much pain. But don't worry, guys. It's not as bad today as it was on Wednesday. And I know, I know, on Wednesday I was in rare form. I think uh, I think it was Mike um, that reached out on the YouTube chat going, dude, do you need a hug? And I'm like, yes, I need a hug. <laughs> Why is everything so hard? Why are people so mean? You know, uh, but today, a little better. Not great, a little better. All right, but 
I got to tell you guys, our topic for today is a big one. Okay, it's a really, really big one. And why is it a big one? Why? You keep talking about this stuff, man. I just want to talk about D&D. Why are you being all, all serious and stuff? I'll tell you why. So, in case you guys are wondering about the late opening today, um, I got called in to one of my myriad of on-call jobs. <laughs> and I'm serious. Like, I think it was around seven o'clock yesterday it was hey stranger how you doing could i get you from seven uh yeah from 8 a.m to 3 p.m tomorrow and i'm like yes i need the money <laughs> and she's like oh god thank you thank you you're saving me all this stuff so been climbing a horse check my tiktok you'll totally understand um i spent today waxing a giant lupita nyongo and it wasn't a terrible experience <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a sad, pathetic little man. Anyway. Mm. Oh, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> hello. Hello, my coffee friend. Hello. So, um, so I got that call and I'm like, well, I guess I'm turning the night um, down because I was going to go to my friendly local game store and see if I could get a game of um, Stargrave in. And I decided to uh, clean my base and change my strings for other YouTube stuff. And I made a decision last night, which is I'm going to put my bass lessons and all that stuff on the standard Patreon, but it's going to be at the really high tier. Okay. We're literally talking the 50 to a hundred dollar a month tier because there's a lot of stuff I want to do on the YouTube channel that I can't. I can't specifically because of copyright reasons, but I can put it on my Patreon and not get flagged. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So if y'all want to learn how to play the bass guitar and you like the gaming stuff, then join the Patreon at the stupidly high tier. Now, make no mistake, the stupidly high tier on my Patreon is up there for music lessons and for high rollers. But... um. Um, that highest tier of a hundred bucks a month is a lot less than most people pay for music lessons. And it's actually what I charge in real life. I just need 10 students, y'all 10 students. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of stuff that I'm doing on bass blast 105. And, um, you know, I was not feeling great about it before I put it up there because um, there's guys like Charles Burkhoff and Davey 504 and so many other people, not to mention um, God, well, well, Scott's bass lessons. That guy, that guy, okay, that guy is to teaching the bass guitar what play on tabletop is to doing battle reports, um, what critical role is to gaming and all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get any traction with this. I mean, these guys are so good. Why would people come to me? And someone came this close to slapping me in the mouth going and because they like you that's why and by the way you're a really good teacher and i would slap you but i'm afraid that you'll punch me in the face and i said good good call because i might reflectively just Whoa! oh 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 i'm sorry um <clears throat> so last night i'm um i'm getting ready for bed I put on one of the myriad of Warhammer lore channels that I know about because some of the people like um, the Remembrancer and the Arbiter Prince, they just have such relaxing voices, such relaxing voices. It's like a bunch of white guys went to school and had elocution lessons with Morgan Freeman. And um, yeah, so with all that. I'm just like, dude, okay, I'll put those guys on and let them lull me to sleep. Um, that would be just fine. Lulling me to sleep would be just fine. Um, let's see, this is just in case, um, just in case someone I know is watching the stream. The answer is at my house, at my house. I spent gas today, can't make the drive. Um, so there's all that. And I think it was 1 a.m. where I'm lulling myself down, knowing I got to be up at 6.30, and I get a Discord um, message. Hello, sir. Are you awake? 
And I'm like, who the hell is calling? What the, the, who is doing this? And then I look at the name and the answer is one of your ride or die deckers that shares all your stuff and likes and subscribes. And I think one of the first ones to get a t-shirt from the merch store. And I'm like, oh yes, my good man. Of course I can speak to you. What is going on? And they let me know what was going on with the game session. They had literally just ended like less than 20 minutes before. And I found myself um, reflecting over something and that's what led to today's topic okay now i have been gaming for 30 something years and if you're new to the channel yes if you are a subscriber to twitch or youtube or patreon you can bug me for gaming advice at one o'clock in the morning pacific standard time especially if you're like on the east coast or in the south because i'm like dude it's like sunrise where you are and this is bugging you that much fine i'll stay up for a little longer thank you so much neon for putting up the um the discord um invitation that is awesome 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 so um, I listened to them, let them get some stuff off their chest, and yeah, they were in a game that exploded. It's not my story to tell, but um, it did get me thinking about something, and I was able to tell um, this person a story um, of a similar experience to mine, okay, uh, or a similar experience to um, what he was telling me about. Of course, I can tell a story of what happened to me and it'd be a similar story of mine it's my story anyway um oh we're going to be hitting the creations page on discord as well so excuse me so while that discord in, um invitation is easily accessible in the chat by the way um go ahead join the discord put up some stuff that you're painting in the creations tab it's the third text channel on the bid p um on the bid p discord you know we got some stuff um our boy mike has been killing it with his four horsemen of the apocalypse and he paints along with me on the wednesday live stream where you know we do the happy with it show um so with all that um i was able to tell the story of when i joined a friend's homebrew game and i'm like cool you know and this was a particular, um, a very, 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 um, interesting moment in my gaming history because this was a great example of my own anchoring bias. Um, I learned how to play RPGs through the adventuring template. I put together an adventurer. And what I didn't know was that this GM was running a hardcore simulation RPG. And he didn't tell me. Um, not because he was trolling me, but he thought I knew. And I'm like, what? I've never I've never been in a game you've run before. We've only ever we've only ever played magic, played in the LARPs that other people were running, and played War Machine together. How would I know what you're like as a DM? <laughs> um <coughs> and Essentially, it was very unfun for me because this was a fantasy setting with hardcore simulated rules of ancient Europe. So when I made an Outlander character um, that was supposed to be an ambassador, I was thinking, you know, Antonio Banderas, 13th warrior type of thing. Nope. Nope, nope. First freaking game session, first five minutes. I'm arrested, my titles are stripped, my stuff is stolen, and I'm thrown in jail. And I'm like, oh my god, this is not fun. <laughs> um, somebody picked a fight with me in jail, I punched him in the face, he hit his head on the wall, busted it open, and he died. And I'm like, that's the kind of game I'm playing? If I'd known that, I would have made generic character number 402, all right? Um, but yeah, so, uh, and this was a thing, okay, this was a really, really, really big thing, where when it came to the game that he was running, I had no idea of the style, and he didn't inform me of the style, and I was not having a great time, um, because, one, character creation took six hours, and then when I found out 
that I have a bad build for the game that we were playing, I didn't want to spend another six hours making another character, you know, because I want to I want to let you guys know, and this is something that's coming on um, in the show a little later. But there are eras in gaming. That's right. Eras, not errors. No, eras, as in a different time period that indicates a different ideology with the thing. All right. And um, the person that called me up last night was arbiter between a GM and a bunch of players that had this complication. (laughs) So I'm going to share with you guys what I told him today, which are three gaming types that tend to fall onto the onto the um onto the docket and these gaming types are much closer to gaming ideologies okay this is where anchoring bias comes in I made an adventuring character because most games I played were adventures where people were more than human and had, if they didn't have superpowers, they had money, which is like a superpower. <laughs> and, um, and no, I was thrown into this game where I'm playing a diplomat in a hostile nation. I don't know how to do that. I don't like politics. Like I literally don't like the act of governance. So, um, So, yeah, I was out of my depth, out of my mind, and it wasn't very fun. However, it wasn't wrong. It wasn't wrong, and this wasn't a bad GM, okay? This was a GM that made an error in assuming that I knew what was going on. But, see, this was his anchoring bias directly clashing with my anchoring bias. You feel me on that? Cool. Um, so when it comes to that kind of thing, what do we do? What do we do? How do we navigate that? Well, first off, we need to talk about the three types of gaming that there are. Okay. And this is really big and really important because when we go through these gaming ideologies and we understand where we are on the spectrum, where we are willing to compromise on the spectrum and what our deal breakers on this spectrum are, that will help us either avoid horrible gaming system, uh, horrible gaming experiences or learn to navigate them because it's really easy to navigate say a situation where you know the components and no back away from your keyboards i know a lot of people are like well maybe i'll just leave yeah if you've got your own car okay but you might be 11 you might be 12 you might be 17 and broke okay so now you're stuck at this game with this weird ideology not having a good time how do you salvage the night we're going to get into that after i run some ads Oh, boy. So, let's see who's here. I I can't believe somebody looked up my address (laughs) on Google Maps and was like, Hey, you live by a park, too. Like, yeah, I do. (laughs) You know, I've talked about the park on the show many times. Many, 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 many times. Um... Yeah, it's the park that I learned to play basketball in, the park that I learned to swim in, the park that I learned how to tie a tourniquet in. Um, there, there was a lot. Uh-huh. My house. And put up pics of your stuff in the Discord. So, yeah. Um... But yeah, so I'm just like, oh, okay, well, wait. I'm like, did you Google Maps my house? And they were like, yeah, I did. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, you are so right. You are so right, Neon. This isn't my beautiful dungeon. This isn't my beautiful group. And you say, how did I get here? Letting the game go by. Rolling dice to try, to try and cope. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, we're back. <laughs> 
and you may find yourself sitting in a simulation game, and you might find yourself stuck role-playing with NPCs, and you might find yourself armed to the teeth in the middle of a city, and you may find yourself sitting in front of politicians. You know, uh, um, you're, uh, I'm going to be on that all day. Thanks, Neon. You did this. All right? And if you guys are groaning in the comments, groan at him. Groan at Neon Orlikino. Like, look at what you did. Look at what you did. You did this. Anyway. Um, so, we are going to tackle the three gaming ideologies that there are out there. Because I've seen so much of this clash. And I've seen so many people dig in hard partly because of their anchoring bias and partly because of where Karen's come from. <laughs> All right. Stop it, man. I actually wrote a script for this. <laughs> I'm trying to stick to the script and he's like as the quest goes by cobalt's mining underground. <laughs> Once in a six side <laughs> Cobalt's flowing underground. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Good job taking over the show. Do I have to put you back under your bridge? You've been doing so well for the past year. You really have. Um, so, <clears throat> back to the subject. Um, the three types of gaming ideologies, the three types of gaming styles, and when I say ideologies... I mean, again, we're leaning into the whole anchoring bias thing, which is, to begin, let us define anchoring bias. Anchoring bias is the psychological condition to where the way that you learn something is the primary way that you believe it is, was, and always will be. Most of the time, without exception. And that bias can be really strong. If you don't believe me, talk to a boomer about buying a house these days. You know, um, you know, anchoring bias is strong. And the three main anchoring biases that come down when it comes to RPGs, now that it's gone mainstream, is based on how people are initially exposed to the RPG, I don't want to say community, but I do want to say lifestyle. Um, yeah, RPG lifestyle, RPG community, RP, you know, just the, the standard, mm, excuse me, ah, yeah, the standard RPG-ing, you know, oh, no, that's weird, oh, no, it's not, um, so, boop, 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 boop. Ha ha. Ahoy, hoy, hoy. There it is. All right. Sorry. That little thing right there was just killing me. Ah! Fade away. All right. Yeah, there we go. I'm back. Now, um, the oldest gaming style that there is out there is what I like to call the straight up dungeon delve. Okay, straight up. The straight up adventure dungeon del delve. Um, if you guys have ever heard of the game Munchkin from Steve Jackson Games, this is what RPGing is, all right? Um, also, if you've played games like the Diablo series from Blizzard, you know, um, where you go into, or the Final Fantasy um, games as well, where you go somewhere, you beat up monsters, you take their stuff, you get better to beat up more monsters. That's the whole thing, all right? That, that's the whole gig. I mean, that, that is literally what it is. It's an adventure. We got a mission. Your mission is to go into them sewers and kill all the alligators and their spawn. You know, backstory, who cares? Yeah, Golden Axe, um, Gauntlet is an, another one. Thank you, Neon. Um, 
Yeah, you just go in there and you may get a climactic scene at the end of Poor Peter Parker, you're all alone now. And you can be like, well, not really. I mean, I've got a really hot girlfriend. I've got friends at school. My aunt is actually pretty cool. No, no, Peter Parker, you're alone now. You know, I mean, that might be what you get. But chances are, no. <laughs> you know, um, hmm. I believe in life after love. Or my analytics. There we go. Um, so, with that, um, again, with that, a lot of people put together combat oriented characters or puzzle oriented characters um you don't get a whole lot of charismatic bards when you know you're going into a dungeon delve because there's not going to be very many people to talk out of fights and stuff you're fighting monsters you're picking locks you're jumping over spiky pits you can hear john williams music in the back and you're going to remember to grab your hat when the trap goes off and you're running from the great big ball okay i mean that's straight up what it is we're talking raiders of the lost ark act one scenes one through three that <laughs> and that is what um and that is quite literally what um what the very first type of RPGing was, okay? And we're talking back with Gygax and the boys back in 72. You know, it was all about going into the cave, beating up the stuff, getting the treasure, going home. Even back in first edition, you could literally trade gold for levels. You can buy your way up to level 10. Um, sometimes you had to. You know, the game started as Chainmail, and when Dungeons & Dragons came out, that's what it was, and that's what a lot of people are anchored to. They like going into the dungeons, okay? Um, now, the second way, okay, and this, this is really big, is role-play heavy. Let's talk to every NPC. Let's talk our way out of fights. Let us have our characters work in a logical manner that is determined by narrative structure that I learned in my college creative writing courses and all of the fanfic that I've been writing for a long time. Now, this has always been out there. Um, however, however... Um, it was a subsection of RPG years, pretty much from the 90s to present. Um, but it was really a sub of the subgroup, okay? And the game that really brought this kind of role-playing to the forefront, um, no, no, it was not Dungeons & Dragons or Critical Role. It was actually Vampire the Masquerade back in 1992. Um, that game was modern fantasy, but it wasn't about shooting up everybody <laughs> and running around the streets of a major city being a monster. Okay. Hey, what's going on? 250 Mike. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, you were a monster and you did gun down a lot of people and you were acting like a vampire going, nom, 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 mm, homeless blood tastes like methadone. Nom, 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 nom. Um, but God, what is up with me today? <laughs> um, yeah, I made myself laugh on that one. Um, but you had to preserve the masquerade. You couldn't let anyone know that you were a vampire. And being a vampire, operating with other vampires, then you're now playing Game of Thrones, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, you know what? Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is still a video game, okay? And video games have to end with the huge fights against the big bad evil thing, all right? Because I have not reached my final form. What are you, what is that? I don't know. This is like Final Fantasy XX15 IV beta. Um, I don't know, but it's got a lot of wings and I think those are clock parts. You know, I mean, that that's just what video games do, all right? Um, very few video games end in a conversation, all right? 
Hell, even Scott Pilgrim ended with a video game fight, you know, after he found out that he was a jerk and he needed self-respect. Spoilers for a 20-year-old movie. Anyway, um, and there are a lot of people that love that. They love intrigue. They love building up their army of invisible spies, their networks, their, you know, I control the mafia and the police. I can do what I want in this city. I'm a sad little king of a sad little hill. <laughs> nom, 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 nom. Mmm, hobo. Nom, 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 nom. You know? Um, and the third way, okay, the third way. And this is big because I should actually call the third way um, a flavor of the other two, all right? It's like top and bottom of quark, all right? Yeah, you can go, you know, up, down, charmed, strange, bottom, and top. You know, they're, they're flavors, you know? Um, because these are the simulators, Okay, um, now, what do I mean the simulators? Well, we've all had those games where someone, probably a very salty person, used my least favorite term. Like one of the terms that I want to cut off when I hear it, which is, well, if this were real life, shut up, it isn't. It's a little game of pretend. We're moving our po our toy soldiers around the map. We're going pew pew. We're going <laughs> or Wingardium Leviosa or you shall not pass. This is not real life. Yes, I wear gray robes. Yes, I carry a staff. And yes, I can see the giant demon made of flame and smoke that's on the bridge, which is why I take the freeway. However, this is real. <laughs> this is real life. But what we're doing right here is we are playing a game. Okay. Um... But the simulators are the ones that go, I'm going to run this game as though it's real life. Okay. And this is just my experience, mind you. This is, this is, this is me interacting with people at various tables over time. But I find that the simulators... The hardcore simulators are the people um, that have a very negative outlook on life because the ones who run in the hardcore simulations, you know, if this is real life, this is what I would be doing. It doesn't make sense for me not to murder that person. Yeah, it does. Because, um, sorry to tell you, um, you wrote that your character is morally good and murder is wrong. Especially if it's one of your party members, <laughs> you know, like I, I get that it's fantasy and stuff, but you're talking, I disagree with this person that I work with. I'm going to stab them in the mouth with a soldering iron, you know, um, but that's just me poking fun at some people I know. Okay. Y'all know who you are, but, um, but the big thing, the big thing um, wow, we've got Xanathate saying, oh, it bugs me so much when people try and use modern science in games, especially fantasy like D&D. Um, again, nothing wrong with using it, but basing your game on that is a little wrong. Uh, because, again, scientifically speaking, um, we haven't found elves. I mean, we have dwarfs and Shout out to the Dinkle, you know, if Peter Dinklish is watching this, I don't know why he would, but if he's watching this, what's up, man? I love everything that you do because you do it. And if anybody else was doing it, I would probably hate them. Um, and that's where I'm going with that. I swear to God, I wish I had your voice, um, you know, but and your bankroll, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and these hardcore simulators are the type of GMs that do want to apply modern science and modern cynicism to the games they play. These are the ones that tend to run dark and brutal games, you know. Um, and again, none of these um, types 
of gaming ideologies are incorrect, nor are they bad, nor does it make the people who fall under them bad, okay? However, none of them are wholly compatible with the others in a vacuum, okay? That is really, really important. Um, Take my experience with the game that my friend ran, okay? Had I known that this was going to be a hardcore simulation game that's based on his understanding of medieval politics, I would not have made a person of color from a foreign country, okay? I would not have done that. Why? Because this guy grew up in the United States, and the United States pretty much says that if you don't pass the paper bag test, you weren't welcome in most of Europe, <laughs> okay? That's just... That's just what we're taught here in the States. I don't know if it's true, okay, because we don't learn a lot about European history. So, um, you know, putting the portal at the bottom of the ocean with the other side and a bag of holding with a good shield, that's super soaker with the strength to rip off flesh. You were terrible. Um, but that is actually a very good example of using modern science um creatively in a game however again modern science modern politics or modern understanding of politics within the realm of say an rpg there's nothing wrong with it as long as everyone has been communicated with and on the same page okay now i talked um about a month ago about the differences I've seen between men and women as role players. Women tend to, um, in, in my research, women were found um, to prefer character interaction and role play in role playing games versus dungeon delving and combat stuff. Okay? And I say tend to, I'm saying by a margin of about 22 to 30 percent, depending on region. Okay, um, you know, I know my sister all about that action, you know, but a lot of the women at the gaming stores that I go to aren't about that action. They want to know what happened to that NPC, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, you know, that that's exactly the point, Neon. Thank you very much for pointing that out. I wasn't going to go that route. Uh, Neon Arlecchino says, definitely, a good cowboy RPG can be grand, but no one wants to wind up in pre-Juneteenth Texas without having the S-word conversation first. Right? You know, that's the whole thing. Um, so, if a person's running a fantasy game and they want to make it hardcore simulation... Their definition of hardcore simulation has got to be made clear. Um, as you guys know, if you are not new to the channel, I hate implied things. I just, I, I hate them. Okay, I really do. Because, honestly, most communication problems I have come to learn about have come because one person implied something or another person inferred something based on their individual stories. And let's just say they're not always compatible. You know, I'm literally in therapy because when people cut me off, I flash back um, to being silenced in bad relationships and by family. Okay. Um, it doesn't occur to me that that person might just be eager to make a point before they forget. Okay, um, because I grew up hearing, no, you can't talk because I know what you're about to say and you're wrong. And so I want to grab a cast iron skillet and start beating in faces. But I don't do that because it's illegal and it's not the type of person that I would like to be. All right. I live under the, the premise of one, do unto others as I would have them do unto my kids. And second... Um, um, 
if I want to be a decent person, I have got to be the type of person that I want my kid to bring home and say, this is who I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. Because if they did that and I go, cool, then I'm a decent person. Okay. If they did that and I'm like, oh, no, you're not. Where's my gun? Then I got work to do. <laughs> All right. That's that's that. That was something that occurred to me when my ex-wife was pregnant with my kid. I'm like, oh, my God, I better make myself a better person. <laughs> um, Because this person's going to look at me and say, that's how to be an adult. No, <laughs> this is not it. <laughs> you know, Um. So, yeah, so I don't grab the cast iron skillet and I have to pull myself back when it comes to my interpretation of things. And this is why I don't like implying or being implied to, because what I find realistic in my life is really different from what a lot of my friends find realistic. OK, example, one of my friends from the nice side of the tracks needed my help getting their car smogged. I live in Southern California. If you know, you know. And we had to go to a certain part of Compton. And this this friend of mine, beautiful woman, by the way. However, if she had had a German accent, she would have really, really been favored in history. <laughs> um, and we're in Compton. And I, um, we go to the gas station. And... When I walk into the gas station, I know just intrinsically, instinctively, because it is common sense in that area to go to the cashier and ask for a token to use the bathroom. She'd never seen that before. That's not the side of the track she's from. OK. Um, and that being the case, that let me know that there's a lot of things that are normal for me that are completely foreign to her. And when she talks to me, I constantly have to remind her that I can't just buy an $800 plane ticket to Cancun and go because there's a job there. Okay. I, I'm not at that point yet, you know, so, you know, and we're good friends. We, we talk a lot about stuff, but we come from different places. So there's a lot of implications there. So I always push communication. And when it comes to the games that I run or the games that I join, okay, I have to ask the questions. Is this a hardcore simulation game? Be or is this an adventure, an adventure game? All right. I learned the difference. Um, and this was way before the game that I made, the outlander who was thrown in prison and bullied and then accidentally murdered somebody and all that stuff. Um, the first time I played the game for the hardcore realists, which is uh, Call of Cthulhu from Chaosium Games. <clears throat> and there are two major things within a game that really determines um, whether or not it's hardcore, you know, and that is accessibility to magic and consequences of violence. OK, those are two really big things. You take a bullet and call of Cthulhu and you live, you're going to be limping probably for the next two or three adventures. Because most of them are set in the 1920s and their tech back then was not great when it came to lead poisoning. Um, so, yeah, this is this is a really big one. Mm. So. I sat down and I didn't know that about the Call of Cthulhu game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They didn't even have antibiotics back then. You know, the best they could do is freaking um, break into the rich guy's liquor cabinet and pour some of the good vodka on it so, <laughs> and hope for the best. <laughs> you know, watch Tombstone, pay close attention to Bill Paxton. That's the medicine they had back then. So violence is not really an option if you want to hold on to your character in Call of Cthulhu. You know, and casting spells and doing like fantasy D and D stuff that comes at a hefty cost if you play through enough games to even get access 
to a spell book and it will probably drive you mad <laughs> uh yes the consumption <laughs> yep yes the consumption and the freaking diphtheria and the colic <laughs> you know most of the babies died of the rickets especially in a call of cthulhu game this is what we're talking about um that's why these games are primarily investigation puzzle solving that that kind of thing because yeah good luck punching a Waitley in the face again if you know you know um however I didn't know this. I made an adventuring character and I felt kind of useless. You know, I was the guy in the party that had the gun. Couldn't drive, but had the gun. Like I got, I got the gun. You know, I was almost as bad as the fat kid from Stand By Me um, who brought the comb. You know, that's how useless I was. <laughs> but I brought the comb. Oh man, I dropped the comb. You know, I mean, that that's really uh what i was at you know i mean it was it was not great just just not great um so in that one i was playing again um that particular game was a role playing game investigating talking to people playing a character doing a lot of improv acting not a whole lot of beating up the monster and definitely not a lot of obvious theft, <laughs> you know. Um, and the thing was, and I, I actually have to give this guy a call. Um, he made it very clear the world is against you. Um, the cosmos is indifferent or hostile toward you. And the police are super inefficient when you need them. But they're all hyper-efficient when coming after you. And I'm like, bro, we live in Orange County, and look at me. Why would I play this game? <laughs> you get me? <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, when it, when it came to playing Call of Cthulhu, when I went into Call of Cthulhu with a Dungeons & Dragons mindset, I was out of sync. The frequencies were not compatible um however once i understood that the frequencies weren't compatible i was able to navigate the game and i still had a whole lot of fun um i even survived and i learned how to get sanity points back in call of cthulhu which is doing nice things you know, hey, look, we survived the, the hideous horrors that were neither pieces of lunch meat nor were they auto parts, but something hideous and unholy from betwixt the twain that man should not know. I'm going to make snow angels. That's what I'm going to do. That Nope, nope, that's what I got. I'm, I'm making snow angels. Look, uh, I like New England in winter. I can make snow angels. Do not look at the barn. Snow angels. Yay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, going to therapy in... in and Call of Cthulhu is the fastest way um, to get Sandy back. But, you know, taking some me time, taking a little bit of a mental health day. Like, I think my character is going to paint some miniatures and listen to some Evanescence. The, oh, wait, no, it's the 1940s. Okay, I'm going to listen to some Walter Winchells. <laughs> I don't know what we're talking about, but all of the stuff on the radio sounds just like this. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I can do that. I don't need to see the freaking goat tank that's been following us. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to think about that. I don't know what I did last Saturday, okay? That's it. I don't know. I was nowhere. I stayed home. I was knitting. Yeah, I was knitting, you know? And talking about it, even making fun of the game that I was playing back then, that was where the fun came from because I was able to navigate that now, since I wasn't going to be ha 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 ha, ha like Sir Lancelot and Holy Grail. Um, again, if you know, you know. Um, I was able to have a much better game. Okay, but the reason I was able to do that was that the person running the game communicated after the first session. <laughs> you know, after the first session, I'm like, oh. 
got it. Yeah. This is not an adventure. <laughs> this is a case. All right. I can look at this like a case. You know, and it didn't help that I came back with shell shock. Because <laughs> um, this was right after the Great War. You know, right after the Great War. So I got off the boat and I kissed a brunette. But then I had to go find a job. You know, that kind of thing. And, um... Again, the gaming session was great. The GM, or the gaming campaign was great. It was about five sessions long. It was fantastic. Once I knew that it was role-playing in a hardcore setting. All right? Now, where do these things go weird? I will tell you when I run a commercial on Twitch. Or maybe I should just start cutting myself off like in The Sopranos. Um, so... Um, these types of things can go wrong, very wrong, when the anchoring bias of these ideologies clash and neither party is willing to bend. Now, as you guys know, I do DM tips all the time, okay? And this one, this episode, um, comes with the DM tip of the DM may want deep down in places they don't talk about at parties to run a certain type of game. I'm going to run a horror game. Um, or I'm going to run a hardcore, you know, dark game. I want Dark Souls. That's what I want. I want to do Dark Souls where where the the ending is still going to be bittersweet at best because I like my games like I like my coffee. Blacker than the blackest black times infinity, you know. And the players might be like, nah, we're going to plant flowers. My little pony, my little pony, friendship is magic, my little pony. And if the DM isn't willing to compromise, then the game is going to fall apart. Now, again, if you're trying to run darkness, imprisoning me, and your players are running butterfly in the sky, how do you find that Charlie the Unicorn? You know, how do you find that dragon prince? <laughs> you know, and the answer varies from GM to GM, players to players, okay? There isn't one answer because the reason for the anchoring bias leading to ideology changes from player to player to player to player. And I'm including GMs within the label of player because a GM plays D&D. That's just the rule that they play is the GM or um, the narrator or the storyteller or the fate master or whatever it is that you want to call the person that writes all of the plot points. You know, they're playing the game as well. Okay. Now, a good amount of the time, people dig in. This is where this is where the bias becomes ideology. There is no one way to play an RPG. A lot of people go, no, it's hardcore. I run my games, and when I run my games, I'm going to run my games like they're real life. And I'm like, you ever take a bullet? Well, well no. You ever steal a car? Well, well, no, that's illegal. Have you ever been arrested? Well, no. You ever fight a basilisk? Well, no. Then how are you running this as a real game? Uh, like, as real life? Because half of these creatures don't exist, and you don't have life experience to know what the realistic thing about this is. Okay? And it's like, oh, well, have you ever been arrested? Oh, yeah, quite a few times. Well, you ever go to jail? Holding. You know, never convicted. <laughs> but, um, but yes. And Neon Arlecchino has a question of, isn't Call of Cthulhu always in weird territory? Yes, it is always in weird territory. But the consequences of actions are always very grounded in a world that sucks. I think the only world that sucks even more than Call of Cthulhu is cyberpunk. Think about it. Um, <coughs> um... 
that's that's a discussion I may have on a weekend or maybe a full-fledged podcast. I don't know. But if I have that full-fledged podcast debate, I'll probably put it on the Patreon. Just letting you know. Uh, yes, 40K is up there. <laughs> yes, 40K is absolutely up there. And, yeah, with Sucky Worlds, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 40K is very, very high up there. Um, so... Where do we go with this? Well, understanding that the anchoring bias leading to ideology, you can have a better understanding of the type of players you're at the table with or the type of GM you have. All right. But these are really important questions to ask. Now, instead of sitting them down... And putting a bright light on them and saying, what kind of game do you run? You know, you can always just ask a few of the following questions. How long does it take to heal from being stabbed? <laughs> does this game have hit points or consequences? Oh, yeah, you're running, um, you're running D&D? Cool. Are we using conditions? <laughs> you know, uh, make no mistake. Even in my fantasy world, um, well, let me, let me back up. There is a difference between realistic and brutal, okay? Realistic is why I have the writer character make a constitution check every once in a while because they spend their time drinking and I'm just waiting until they throw up or pass out. Because I don't care what world you're from. You'll at least pass out. Gimli showed us that in Lord of the Rings. Okay? Um, and Pippin did not. Comes in paints. I'm getting one. You know? Um, it's almost that time. Not to end the stream, but to pour another cup of coffee. Um... That's right. In case you guys are wondering, yes, there is a Keurig in arm's reach just off of just off of camera. And I tend to have one in every room of my house that I spend a lot of time in. Sadly, I had to take the one off of my nightstand and replace it with a heater. Because winter isn't coming, winter's here. Okay. Um, which is sad because there's no sad songs. About the weather in January, you know, when it used to get cold in November, I had Tom Waits, you know, but now I'm like January. Who writes a song about January? You know, can't even sing Calendar Girl because it makes me think of Deadpool and I'm not dating Marina Bakara. <laughs> so I don't I don't have a calendar girl. Anyway. um, So as I was saying with the simulations and all that stuff. Asking the questions. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I do. And I don't wear that mask because I'm not good with computers. Um, anyhow. Um, ranting and weird stuff aside, by the way. Thank you guys for watching me over on YouTube. Don't think I don't see you guys there. And I appreciate you guys there lurking. Um, but asking the questions, cause you know, you can be like, yeah, is this a hardcore simulation game? And in my experience, not a lot of players have the same definition of hardcore simulation. So asking the questions that comprise the definitions of the terms, it's a much better way of communicating. You know, if my character took an arrow to the knee, <laughs> Is their adventuring career over? <laughs> you know, or um, will they be fine after a long rest? You know, that that's a good question. You know, um, do we use conditions in this game? <laughs> you know, how does psychic damage affect my character? You know, all of these questions are really big. You know, in Call of Cthulhu, um, psychic damage are hits to your sanity. No! I have phobias now. Um, we're in D&D. &D. Eh. <laughs> Unless you're at my table. 
which case you're getting a phobia and you're definitely starting with a phobia of the person that did the psychic damage to you if you fail your wisdom save all right yeah vicious mockery is brutal in my game <laughs> you know and again when you grow up where i grew up um your mama jokes hurt <laughs> It hurts almost as much as looking at your mom. Ooh, you know, um, you know, I honestly think that fifth edition D and D or sixth edition should actually have a couple of specters on uh, non-combat inspectors appear, um, to bards when they use vicious mockeries just to go, Ooh, Oh, Oh, that's messed up, man. That's messed up. Because it always hurts a little more when you've got the peanut gallery. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. Um, yeah, that would actually be kind of funny. <laughs> you know. But that's just how I run things. I like the absurd. Um, but again, when you are running your game or when you're going into someone's game, understanding what kind of game you're going into gives you the agency to choose whether or not you sit at that table. And I know it can get kind of weird, okay? And by weird, I mean, well, it's the only game in town. I've been there. <laughs> I feel like I'm barely starting to understand how to play a bard. Um, that makes sense. Although Vine Constrict, by the way, everybody say what's up to Vine Cons Conscript. You guys know them from um, from Warp Tumblr C24, um, the rowdy one, <laughs> the one with cards, um, and a new violin. Um, of course, you're just now learning. This is your second campaign, <laughs> and the first time you've played a bard takes a while to wrap your head around it unless you sit down with the books and read them and then do your research for three to five hours a day i would never ask that of my players this is a game not a college course you know <laughs> uh you know i just totally got the fact that that uh, rhymed you know like two weeks ago i'm like oh yeah, howdy rowdy yeah all right cool um but yeah, so, but this is a great example now that one of the warp tumblers are here because, oh my God, am I used to running swashbuckling adventure fantasy games um, that fall into the dungeon delving category where like people are swinging from chandeliers and stabbing folks and all that stuff, you know, just being like, haha, but unless, unless the enemy has studied his Agrippa, ha, which I have, oh no, I admit that you're better than I am, then why are you smiling? Because I know something you don't know, you know, um, uh, that's the stuff I'm expecting. And I get like, I'll take you with the part. I'll beat you both together. Actually, let's talk about this. So, uh, you want to have a fight? Let, I mean, what's so important? What's really so important that you would turn to violence? By the way, my friend here turns into stars. They turn into celestial bodies and burn the flesh from freaking bone. Or we can talk. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, that's. All right, that yeah, yeah, psychic damage. Wow, um, you know it, it's that kind of thing. I'm like, wow, this is this is a game with two clerics that can say, "Hey, God, grant me the grace to put my mace in his face." You know, oh wow, I was almost like on an Eminem thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, you know that that itself, you know, is something I'm not used to because. I run, again, um, I run swashbuckling adventures most of the time. You know, even when these characters found themselves on a ship, I'm like, aha, you can buckle those swashes now. And they're like, let us investigate this crew. And I'm like, glad I know how to run Call of Cthulhu. All right, let's do this. All right, let's, let, let's do it. We're not, we're not swashing any buckles, you know, or buckling any swashes. That's fine. We can deal with that. And why? Because the consensus of the players don't want that kind of game. And if I try and shoehorn them into a game that they don't want to play, unless I am really good, and I mean better than Matt Mercer is perceived to be, they're not going to have fun. 
And if they're not having fun, I'm not having fun. And then I'm sitting in a really, really cold studio wasting my time and their time. And your guys' time. As you guys are watching us go, I don't, I don't want to do that. You know? Now, there's a second part to these gaming styles that we are going to talk about. And we are talking about it right now. But, well, not right now. Actually, yeah, we're going to talk about it right now because I can't run a commercial break. Um, but buckle in, guys, because this is where we start getting realish. All right? Um, because we need to discuss what happens when the game styles collide and we have the unstoppable force of the players at the table versus the immovable object of an obstinate DM. Now, you might be thinking, what? That ain't a big deal. What in there? Unstoppable, obstinate DM, whatever. Oh, no. No, 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 guys. Because it goes deeper than just get up and leave. All right? We are going to delve into why these forces are unstoppable. Why these objects are immovable. And guess what? It has everything to do with the operative word of the 21st century. Trauma. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I, oh, wow. A couple of people on YouTube were like, nope, I'm out. Nah, too heavy. Uh, I like it when this guy's all wacky and telling jokes and being self-deprecating. I know. I'm fully cognizant of that. But... Um, the traumas that come down, there is something that was categorized about 14 years ago within the role-playing space called Bleed. Now, I live in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is home to some of the flakiest, irresponsible people who look at you when you did, like you did something wrong. When they hit you, when they hit your car and they don't have um, insurance, right? They look at you like you messed up, all right? And um, and this has created a a cycle. I want to say a cyclical effect. Cycle is a much better word. Um, of people reacting to past trauma in the present. Okay, so what happens when the immovable object of the obstinate DM hits the unstoppable force of the players at the table? At that point, the argument is no longer about the game. It is about our agency versus your authority. Okay. Or, an easier way to say it, it is a clash of egos. Okay, a super big clash of egos. And I'm not saying that in a negative manner. All right? I'm, I'm serious. I'm not saying that in a negative manner. This is literally a clash of perceived importance of self. And some folks base their whole praxis on whether or not folks obey them. I'm dead serious. They, they, they do this. Um, I've known quite a few in my time. And, um, and some folks base their whole practice on whether or not they can think for themselves. Or more to the point, they are allowed to think for themselves. And that's where a lot of this stuff gets sticky. Okay. It gets really sticky. Really quickly. Um, when the GM is 
essentially season one through present Cartman going, you will respect my authority, you know, um, is it a game that's worth playing? Absolutely not. <laughs> However, can you navigate the situation, save the game and save the friendship that's attached to the game? That is the challenge. And I'm about to give you guys some charismatic tips. Grab a pencil. Okay. Charismatic tip number one is to not get caught up in the emotions of the moment and understand what the parties are actually fighting for. Not fighting about. Fighting for. What What are they fighting for? What? What is it that has them so committed to this thing. Why are they trying to die on this hill? Are they answering childhood trauma? Are they saying, this is how my mom and dad trapped me and I won't take it anymore? You know, um, are, they, are they saying, if you don't obey me, I am not worth anything? Don't know. But if you can discern what the stuff is really about, then you can navigate your way through that moment. The second thing, okay? And this should be the first, but I always want to give people a moment to take in a big point, okay? But the second thing is, what is your motivation for playing? Not theirs, your motivation for playing, not arguing, okay? And here at Back on the Deck, we don't stick with surface answers. It's not just because I want to have fun. Define fun. I know a lot of people whose fun is based on the conflict. Um, one of our deckers, good old Zen, who's probably making dinner right now, um, <clears throat> pointed out in very eloquent words that the game, a lot of the time, is just a delivery system for the competition. Okay? Um, so, understanding why you are wanting to play this game. And I mean at your core. What is your actual thing? Um, one of my old gamer friends... He and I had a falling out over a girl. Um, no, I wasn't trying to date her. Um, and neither was he, actually, ironically. Um, we had a falling out. But he made it very clear to me at one particular point that he, though he has all of the D&D books up to 3.5, and when I say all, I mean all. All, all the second edition books, all the Dragon magazines. The dude's got a map of Greyhawk in his living room over his workstation. Okay, um, he does do the D, the D's and D's, but he says the game doesn't mean anything for me. He told me flat out. He runs the game or he hosts the game so that he can hang out with his friends. And it doesn't matter to him what the people who come over are doing as long as they come over and do stuff. And I'm like, okay, all right. Now, my neural spice is not that flavor, but I understand his. All right. Um, one of the people in our campaign had to win. All the time. He was like Emilio Estevez's dad in freaking The Breakfast Club. You've got to win, Andrew. Win. There's no place for losers. Arr! And so they min-maxed all of their characters and rules lawyered everything to where they never lost a conflict. It just wasn't worth it. They weren't fun to play with. Because for them, playing the game was... An exemplification of how they were the smartest person in the room. Well, Solar, you know all this stuff. Why do you play games? 
I play games because I like being in an environment with people where positive feelings should be the number one um, goal. And I like rolling dice. Like, I know a lot of dice goblins that go, <laughs> dice are mine. And I'm like, yay! They rolled and showed a number. This is why I need $3 million so that I can go to Vegas and do that and not feel bad at the end. You know, yay! It made a number. Oh, you're giving me more of those, those circle things. Cool, yay! It made a number and you took away my circle thing. Yay, it made a number. You know, I mean, that that's... You know, I that I, I just like doing that. But, you know, when I play an RPG, I like being silly. I like making voices. Or sometimes I'll play an RPG because I feel like being dark. Dark and edgy. You know, so dark that my chemical romance looks at me and says, Dude, have, have a freaking zany bar. You know, sometimes I'm just that dark. You know, blacker than the blackest black. You know, but when I am that dark... I go to flavors, and that is super dark, but um, calm. I go Hannibal Lecter, or I go the police. Not badge-wielding people who put people in jail. I'm literally talking about the band. Read their lyric sheets. Trust me. Uh, um, you know, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm totally happy, and that's perfectly fine that my um, baby sister died of cancer. You know, that that's, you know, it happens. You know, sometimes babies get cancer. You know, that's just a thing. You know, by the way, don't stand so close to me. <laughs> no, seriously, don't, don't, don't stand. Don't stand so, don't stand so close to me. Okay. You know, and don't worry, every breath you take, I'll be watching. Okay? <laughs> every move you make. I'll be watching. I'll be, you'll never have to worry whether or not you'll have to get a hold of me because I'll be watching. Okay? I got you. I totally got you, you know? I mean, that that's, you know, sometimes I do get that kind of dark. Um, and sometimes I do both. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the Deckers that you guys have met here in the chat met me in the game where half of my personality was a freaking engineering student. And the other half was Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and it was a coin toss as to which one I would be playing at any point in that LARP. You know. <laughs> but I always combined my actions with bold curiosity for the adventure ahead. <laughs> Down. Not online. Only do that in Roblox. Just in Roblox. Um. So, yeah. Quite honestly... I know my reasons for playing the game. And if I am if I'm clear on my own motivations for jumping into that particular RPG session, then I have a personal goal um, that I can achieve. And if I see that that goal is nowhere in sight, then much like a bad investment in the stock market, <laughs> I sell my shares and get out. You know, I'm just like, nope, uh, yep, that, that's not working. I guess, yeah, that's not a thing. You know, I had hopes, had hopes. But nope, nobody's playing Star Trek Attack Wing. So uh, I guess I got to sell these little figures. Actually, no, I, I can, I, I, I've got little models of Starfleet and I love Star Trek. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, cool. Um... You know, so, mm, so yeah, but if you understand what your motivations are for each game, it will definitely give you a deeper insight as to the motivations for the other people at the game. As I said, one friend just wanted to hang out with his buddies, you know, that's all, just, just, just hanging out with my buddies. That's everything I wanted to do. I made this cup of coffee way too weak way too weak um like every other paycheck too weak um you know and i have one particular friend my best friend as a matter of fact who loves going to larps because they love costumes and props not necessarily cosplay but you know like hey i've got a rocketeer helmet and a, and a jet pack. I need an excuse to wear it because they're starting to look at me funny at work. You know, and I'm like, cool, let's do this, you know. 
Um, and I like all that stuff all the way across the board. Okay. But the idea of leaving your issues and all that stuff behind. Hey. <laughs> Yes, strong and dark, like James Earl Jones. <laughs> well, like James Earl Jones's voice. And James is not that dark, dude. Now, if you're talking Michael Coulter, you know, good old Luke Cage, yes, exactly. Um, so, yeah. And by the way, hello, Citizen Splicer. Thank you for showing up today. <laughs> um, but, yeah, if you understand where you're coming from when you get to the game table, okay, you can then navigate what mixture of these three gaming types that you're going to be dealing with you know the swashbuckling adventure the deep heavy role playing um the gritty realism you know what are you doing <laughs> yes yeah, seriously you know it is friday it is, it is truly friday uh so this is this these things understand you know because again um one of the conflicts that i've seen at gaming tables is the gm that demanded to play a gritty real game where it's violent and and no character has plot immunity and you they're all you know if you roll terribly you die and no one wanted to play at his table you know, for one, for a couple of reasons. Reason one, character creation takes too damn long. <laughs> you know, um, I tried to be the arbiter there saying, look, if he wants to run that game and you might be interested in playing, grab a character from a previous game you played. You know, one that might have already died. You know, one that you're not emotionally invested in so that you can go off and maybe you might find you like having a gritty real game every once in a while. Like, I get why people like Warhammer 40K's lore. Sometimes you want to go dark, you know? So the whole reason people liked Game of Thrones seasons 1, 2, and 3. Um, and some adventurers, let's be real, they want to play Gravity Falls. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. Okay? But the thing is, when one person is trying to force the Owl House... And another person is trying to force Hellraiser, there's going to be conflicts. And if neither party, the gaming crew or the GM, is willing to budge, then much like things that are unbendable, that game is going to break. You know? And I keep saying every show, I've been gaming 30 years! And in that time, you know, so yeah, I've been gaming for 30 years. I dare you to ask me how many of my games, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, how many of my games just died. Games that I was in, games that I was running just died. <laughs> okay. Um, just like, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I don't, I'm not really having fun in that game, so I'm not going to clear my schedule. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> You know, um, I've said it, I've had it said to me, all that stuff, you know, uh, and as you guys have probably figured out at this point, when I talk about the solutions and the best things to reach for and all these things, no words from the back, the main thing we're looking for is balance. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I inject some gritty realism into my games all the time. Again, somebody gets hit with lightning damage. They need to roll a freaking um, constitution save to see whether or not they're stunned. And why? I've been electrocuted before. <laughs> it takes a lot not to be like, oh, God, I'm stuck holding these wires. You know, um. <coughs> <clears throat> you know, um, I've been viciously mocked and bullied to the point where if I saw the person at the same event I was at, I would just get in the car and go home. Sometimes out of fear, 
sometimes, you know, or should I say sometimes out of fear of being mocked by them and sometimes out of fear of me going into a blind rage and throwing a chair at them like I was a character in the boondocks. Um, but either way, the damage was done. You know, even currently I'm recovering from psychic damage. You know, um, my mom worked at a hospital for my entire life. I've seen things. I know what cold damage can do, <laughs> you know, and it ain't pretty. It really ain't pretty. But Solar, you live in L.A. It doesn't snow there. No, but we have labs. We have labs, dry ice, and liquid nitrogen. Okay? I've seen what cold damage can do. Um, you know, so sometimes I'll throw in a little bit of realism. Sometimes, as a GM, since I'm trying to run a swashbuckling adventure, um... If you guys take a really good look at Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, that's a dark story. I'm talking gritty realism other than jumping out of an airplane in a raft. Okay, that's where you get your swashbuckling. But we're talking dark, gritty stuff where a dude is literally crushed to death by by a freaking rolling machine where they, he was turned into pasta and oh god it, it and, and 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 it started from his feet and he got and he's screaming the whole time and and then the wheel like you know showed like okay blood starts here let's make a circle you know um <clears throat> and you can grab some gritty realism out of things that do not have or aren't presented that way, you know? A lot of swashbuckling adventures have some gritty darkness into it, you know? Um, in The Princess Bride, Buttercup thought Wesley was dead. Like, do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not pay the guy at the border, he had been disappeared by pirates, okay? Just gone. <laughs> so when Robin Wright is like, I will never love again, the dude was gone five years, you know? She literally thought that the love of her life was dead for five years. And this wasn't in a time where we had cell phones. So it's not like he could drop a text saying, hey, you up? No. <laughs> okay, he was on a boat, you know, being poisoned and learning fencing and learning sailing and, you know, growing a pencil mustache. You know, I wish I could grow a pencil mustache. I think I'd look good with one. Um... Ah, there we are. Oh, there. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah, sweet nectar. Sweet, sweet nectar. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> and most likely being killed in the morning. Exactly. You know, um, and that's some dark stuff. You know, I know for the first three months of that journey, can you imagine how dark and gritty that life must have been? Calluses on your hands all the time, waking up, looking, looking at people with scurvy and then being told by a dude that you saw stab like five people that he was probably going to kill you in the morning. I'd be mopping very well. Actually, no, I, I wouldn't. That was kind of my childhood, and I still suck at chores. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, again, I just gave you guys an example of the gritty realism that I know. But I kind of grew up in a war zone. I have friends that grew up in the upper, upper middle class suburbs and didn't even know how rich they were. You know, and what's realistic and gritty to them <laughs> bruh bruh okay and again so being on the same page with these adjectives and understanding what they mean by these words and why you are playing the game these are the keys to navigating these worlds you know I had one GM that literally would not eat from a fast food place that had a class B rating um, from the health inspector. Okay, class B. Now, I've worked in restaurants. It's really easy from your grade to go from an A to a B. For example, if the hand washing station is out of paper towels when you're being inspected, that will knock you down to a B. That is an 11 point violation for a reason. And I mean, if it's just out of towels, we're not talking if it's out of soap. If it's out of soap, that's like 14 points, yo. Um, and they just refuse to eat at that. Where right now, where I sit as I talk to you, I've got 
91st, 92nd, Manchester, um, Vermont, and Manchester and Figueroa. Yeah, I've got four street taco vendors. And you know what? Mm, if I had the money in my pocket after this show, I would go and get 10 or 12 tacos. <laughs> All right. And fact of the matter is, if I were to feed these tacos to this particular GM, they'd be like, these tacos are amazing. Oh, my God, the flavor. Where'd you get them? And I'd be like from Marisol under (laughs) under the carport, (laughs) you know, Um, but I had to wait behind the streetwalker because the streetwalker was getting a a quesadilla. Okay, (laughs) but, you know, and they'd be like, oh, my God, it's so unsanitary. (laughs) Yeah, but it is freaking delicious delicious okay um and in their eyes with their upbringing and where they came from that is gritty realism you know versus where i grew up gritty realism is like you know stuff that i shouldn't be talking about online so i'm not going to all right but just stream boys in the hood you know you'll get it in the first 20 minutes um so yeah i mean that's all of this stuff is like really real stuff all right um the definitions of gritty realism the definitions of swashbuckling adventure you know these things can vary you know um like here's an example that i think is fun and feel free to pull up your keyboard because now is the time to at me um John Wick is very much a swashbuckling adventure, even though the fight scenes are so brutal, all right? And it sort of crosses the line into swashbuckling every time he gets hit by a car. But, um, but yeah, the swashbuckling adventure of these cool choreographed fight scenes where they're using weapons from all over the place or most Hong Kong action movies are very swashbuckly fantasy. And all that stuff. Where Full Metal Jacket. Band of Brothers. You know. um, What was the one with Andrew Garfield? Hacksaw Ridge. That stuff. That stuff can get pretty gritty realism. Where Forrest Gump is very swashbuckling adventure. You know. I mean, he never buckled no swashes. But he did have a shrimp bow. You know. And, um, And there's nothing wrong with any of those pieces of media that I just mentioned. They are all enjoyable stories. All of them. You know, um, so funny story. I learned about a month ago that I had Peacock. Okay. I knew I had Paramount Plus, but I didn't know I had Peacock. And with my Peacock subscription, I watched, no, I'm not bringing that one up, although it's relevant to what I was talking about. I'm bringing up the other one. I watched two things, Twisted Metal and the reboot or remake or sequel to the continuation of one of my favorite sitcoms, Night Court. Okay. Both of them swashbuckling adventures that are not realistic in any sense of the word (laughs) except for the weird cases that come through court okay yeah sometimes yeah the auctioneer can probably represent himself going oh i took the knife and stabbed the guy guilty guilty going once going twice guilty you know that that's really um what i can see or a barbershop quartet singing their plea i could see it happening you know but Again, that show is not indicative of what it's like being at court most of the time. It is not gritty and real, but it's fun. And at the end of the day, the stuff that we talk about on this show is about playing games. And games should be fun. However, understanding your motivations for being at the table and what kind of game is being run will have a direct correlative effect on your definition of fun and your likelihood of attaining that fun. Okay, really think about that. And yes, I did watch The Continental as well. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this, this stuff is like really real. When I put on Twisted Metal, I just wanted to see what the show was. Okay, um, not gonna lie, they nailed it with the clown. 
One, because I love clowns. And two, Will Arnett is a national treasure when it comes to playing weird guys. <laughs> um, second best Batman. <laughs> Yes, I like Will Arnett better than I like Michael Keaton. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I'm a traitor to Generation X, but yeah, no, really. You know, Kevin Conroy, Will Arnett, then Michael Keaton, and then Adam West. Um, <laughs> the con Oh, you're cute, Zan. <laughs> Xanathade says, I'm very disappointed that the Continental was not about the Christopher Walken character from SNL. I did not need to see three two-hour movies about him pronouncing champagne. You know? Um, although, not true. I need hours of watching Christopher Walken. <laughs> you know, like right now I have a dream of Christopher Walken and Nicolas Cage being in a movie together. That would be great. You know, it would be intense. It would be over the top. It would be bizarre. <laughs> uh, Christopher Walken free associating. <laughs> and Nicolas Cage flipping out. You know, that would just be awesome. Oh, man. But yeah. And, you know, I did finally get my gangster movie starring um, Christopher Walken and Al Pacino. I believe it's called The Old Guys or something like that. Um... But yeah, yeah, that that's getting off topic. Getting off topic. You're almost you're you're being almost as bad as Neon Arlecchino, Zan. <laughs> almost. <laughs> you know. Next thing you know, you're gonna be telling like really bad puns about kobolds. Um and my guys over on YouTube are being kind of quiet, so this is interesting. Cause I don't know. I think I'm gonna be getting a bunch of emails. Uh let's take a look at the creation page over on the Discord to see uh, if we got some new stuff there. Because I, I really like featuring you guys with um with what you guys have been putting up. Because you guys are good, man. <laughs> that was not a challenge. That was not a challenge then. No, nothing with Cobalts. So let's see. We Oh, okay. Mike C has the rest of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Let's check out Let's check these guys out really quickly. I'm pulling them up. Because, yeah, why not? Because it's my show. I do what I want. Talk about what I want. All right. So we've already seen his war. I don't need your war. You know, however, dude, not going to lie. His pestilence. His pest. Oh, man. This is a great model. And this is a great job painting it, man. A really great. Look at all those hands. You know, I'm, I'm almost. Oh, God. Look at all these hands. He's just made up of hands. It's like, and I don't even know what that is. But, yeah, that, that. Oh, look at. Oh, this is great. That's. I'm almost expecting, like, that thing to be at the bottom of a pit that Jennifer Connelly is falling down. Yes, I am making those types of references. Uh, let's take a look at... Ooh, Plague. Plague, look at this guy. Oh, I'm a plague. Ah. And he reminds me of, like, a Scarecrow uh, variant. You know, which is very cool. He's got some good stuff going over there. You know, let's take a look at all that. Yeah, these are great sculpts, and this is a great paint job, man. You know, just, oh, God. Yeah, your wash came out good. And, oh, my God, look at, look, oh, God, look at those eyes. Look at those eyes. For those of you that don't deal with minis and stuff, I totally get it. Um, Understand, these figures are about two inches tall. Oh, that's a great death. He's like, sup? You know, because, yeah, that, that's what his face says to me. It doesn't quite say, like, death from Discworld, you know, with the hello, you know. No, he, he but not quite, what's up? He's just like, sup? Yeah, I'm here. You know why I'm here. I know why I'm here. So just, yeah, you're, you're getting reaped. That, that's just what's happening right now. Just, there's a reaping. Oh, that is that is really good, Mike. And what you did with these feathers, freaking legend. 
freaking legend. Oh, man. Your, your, your guys' paint jobs, man. Love them. They are so awesome. Um, really good work. Really good work. Liking what I'm seeing here. And what is this? This is a Heliphant. Yes, Heliphant. C-M-O-N. Heliphant of Darkness. It's like an elephant. But it is an elephant that must pay for its sins. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. Oh, man. This is, yeah, this is kind of fun. Oh, wait, what? what's up with, oh, oh, that is not cool. A trunk with tusks? That's, ah, uh, I look at that and I'm like, the last thing I want to see is an elephant saying things like, I have such sights to show you. <laughs> you know, yeah, oh, man, that's, that's good stuff, man. That really is. That's some really good stuff. All right. So let's check the email to see if we got any questions. Um, also check in the Discord, the Discord. I almost said Discord. I'm like, she doesn't watch my show. Uh, general in here. Nope, just my announcements. No fun, ga no fun conversations. What's going on, guys? Really? Meh. Meh. Uh oh, feedback. Okay, and memes. Memes. I really. Really? Oh, oh yeah. I know who put this here. And our moment of zen. Why is there a crocodile buckled in your passenger seat? But Steve isn't a crocodile, sir. I'll have you know he is my navigator. I would be lost without him. Navigator. <laughs> I'm going to have to tell that to my Canadian friend who hates puns. Ooh, maybe I'll get an inflatable alligator and put it in mine. That, that'll that be kind of fun. So, yeah, guys. Um, so, in essence, to wrap up. All right, to wrap up. Um, understanding the three gaming, the three gaming types, not styles, types. This comes down to ideology. The swashbuckling adventure, the role play heavy game that has very little to do with escalating violence, and of course, which flavor of these types a person is dealing with. Um, fantastic, not fantasy, but fantastical, like Indiana Jones, or hardcore, like nobody, you know. Um, or Die Hard, rather. The first three. <laughs> Specifically the first three. First three Die Hards or RoboCop or Predator. You know, that's, that's hardcore. You know, versus all the other Die Hards um, and straight up Tooken, you know. Because, yeah, Liam Neeson trying to hop that fence, you know. I love Liam Neeson. He's another tall man, and he's an actor that's made it in Hollywood being tall, so he's got my, he's, I put Specked on his name, but he ain't jumping a fence like that, even while being chased by a dog, he just kicked the dog, he's just, you know, but he couldn't kick the dog, because he's supposed to be the good guy, and you don't kick dogs, you know, uh, not even if it's a generic hot dog, all right? You eat what you can afford, and you pet the animal, it's that simple. Pet the animal. Stupid Jon Snow and not petting his damn dog until the end. Anyway, um, I want to thank you guys for being here today. Y'all have been amazing and fun. Um, I want to give a major shout out to Vine Constrict, who is going through a thing right now, guys. Um, sh show her some love. Because, I mean, just I've been going through a hard time. She has not been able to get a break, you know, um... You know, life is hard out there. And if y'all are having a hard time and just need some support, leave a message in the Discord. Leave a message in Deckers of the Book because I'm trying to build an actual supportive community. 
All right. And I mean, like when someone says, oh, I'm not feeling great. And somebody answers with a troll like answer, like, you know, well, shut up. Hey, at least you can walk. You know, it could be worse. You could be on fire. I delete those messages and boot those people <laughs> because um, um, there's a rule that says you don't get to make fun of somebody until you know them. And tough love without love is abuse. And you got to lay the foundation for love. You got to build the relationship before tearing a person down, you know. But when it comes to understanding the three game types that there are out there, okay, or the two game types and their flavor, rather, uh, this will help you guys navigate all of your tabletop experiences so much smoother, okay. Um, if I were the type to give you homework, <laughs> I wouldn't do it on a Friday. But what I would like for you guys to actually consider over the weekend or over your gaming stuff um, are games that you've been in, that you've played. How do you look at it? And how do the people around you look at it? We all know someone that's, even when they're winning, if this were real life, um... We know somebody else that's going, friendship is magic, and it's important for the party to make it to the end. And some people are like, don't talk to me. I'm the best there is at what I do, and what I do ain't pretty, bub. You know, I mean, we all have those people that we know. Um, and ask yourself the question, what makes gaming with them fun? Because... We do, and we have fun, and there's all that jazz. So what contributes to that? How can we make that happen? Okay. I'm going to run one more commercial break. I'm going to check the email. And let's see if we've gotten an email at Back in the Deck. Boop, boop. Checking the email real quick, just pulling that up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I know I'm broke. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> My December account statement from PayPal. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Cool, cool, cool. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, that might be a little TMI, uh, Zen. No, not really. There's not TMI here. We don't, we, we don't roll like that. But... Um, so yeah, so seriously speaking, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for watching. And if you're new, welcome. Um, please do me the service of subscribing and liking on YouTube. You know, hit that like, hit that subscribe blah, 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 button. Um, we're still on the goal to get 1,000 followers by or 1,000 subscriptions by the end of February, and there's going to be a big push. Big push in February. I got new editing software that I've learned. I'm able to make stuff going. I was even able to wrangle up a bunch of RAM for one of my computers outside the studio. So now the work will never stop. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, help us out with that and if you guys are new and watching here on twitch then subscribe right down there but don't use your money use jeff bezos's money unless you want a tier two tier three subscription or you just if you've got that money to spend go for it if you don't use your amazon prime account you know it really helps me out and again i love i'm here three times a week with these two hour conversations with you guys and if i get enough subscribers and enough um yeah if i get enough subscribers on these platforms i can go back to doing um two hours a day five days a week along with playthroughs and stuff like that that's the stuff i want to do okay that is really the stuff i want to do but it's not the stuff that i can do unless i can make this my full-time gig so um share this stuff use some of these tips matter of fact over the weekend uh, let me know if you've put some of this stuff I've talked about into use and what your experiences and stuff was with it. I would love to talk with you guys about this stuff. I mean that because I believe in actual community and not the Internet definition. But in order for us to be a community, we've got to commune together. 
All right. Um, I've got some other stuff on the horizons. I'm looking to put together another Decker Day, probably in spring. Um, and if you've got any other questions or comments or anything like that, well, open up your email and type in back in the deck at gmail.com. That's B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K at gmail.com. You can also hit me up on the social medias, same email address, except for on the clock app. That one is B-I-D. Why? And if you're still part of that wretched hive of scum and villainy known as Facebook, um, join Deckers on the book, you know. And of course, um, if Zan would be so kind as to put up a um, invitation um, for um, for the Discord, that would be great. And you guys can talk to us in the Discord and put up the put up the pictures of what you're working on and stuff. I love gushing over all the stuff that people do that's better than I pull off most of the time because I don't want to be number one. Excuse me. But I love the people that are better than me at stuff. I love admiring your guys' work. I love the time and dedication that y'all put into stuff. It's just, it's great for me. So, with all of that, I'm Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, saying thank you guys for being here. And if anybody tells you that you can't like the stuff you like because of the circumstances of your birth, be it race, religion, creed, gender identity, sexual orientation, disabilities, differently ableness, neural spice, or your budget, because if you've ever been to a trailer park, you're walking distance from the hood, you can look at those people dead in the windows of their soul and tell them to take any of those cards they're playing on you and put them back in the deck. I'm Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, saying thank you guys, and we will see you next week on the dark side of the room.